Now, sexual reproduction in plants. So, fusion of male and female gametes is known as fertilization. Fertilization is when the gametes are fused. So, both uh, the types of gametes are fused like male gamete and female gamete, male sex cells or female sex cells. So, it is written here that gametes are the sex cells produced by male and female during sexual reproduction and it gives rise to zygote and finally to the new organism or the plant. Next is pollination. So, pollination is the process in which there is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma of the same or another flower. They are a two types self pollination and cross pollination first come to uh, the self pollination so self pollination can be occurred within the same flower on the same plant like this case within the same flower on the same plant this is the same plant and within the same flower second case between the different flowers but of the same plant. This is the same plant and oh, between the different flowers on the same plant. Next is cross pollination. So cross pollination can be occurred between different flowers on different plants of the same species. Species must be same. If there are some different type of species on which the pollen grains land eventually. So what happens that uh, compatibility does not exist and uh, the pollen tube germination fails. Now come to the agents of pollination. So uh, there are many types of agents uh, which carry out the process of pollination. Those are air, wind, water, insects, birds or other animals. So on the basis of uh, uh, their nature they could be divided as biotic or abiotic agents. Biotic agents are living and abiotic agents are non-living. So air, wind, water, these three are abiotic agents and insects, birds or other animals they are biotic since they are living. Next pollination by insects. So the insects could be honeybee, moth, butterflies or any other insects, any other flies also. Now there are some characteristic features which are shown by some insect pollinated flowers only like they are bright color, like they are bright in color, they produce scent or fragrance to attract insects, they produce nectar because insects visit flowers to collect nectar which, which um, is used as their food and the pollen grains get deposited on their body or their fur. When they visit another flower, they shed pollen grains to the stigma of that plant. If compatibility exists in case of same species, then only fertilization events begin. Now, pollen grains are sticky and produced in less numbers in case of insect pollinated flowers. Some examples of such flowers are dahlia, rose, salvia, mustard, marigold and sunflower. If you could see in this picture, the flower is very bright in color and uh, therefore it attracts pollinator and in this case the pollinator is a fly. Now come to the pollination by wind. Now there are some wind pollinated flowers which possess some following characteristic features. Those pollen grains are light and dry so that wind can blow them easily. These are produced in less numbers. Next pollination by wind. So there are some uh, wind pollinated flowers which possess these following characteristic features. Pollen grains in such plants or such flowers are light and dry so that the wind can easily blow up them or carry away them. These are produced in large numbers. 
so that if wastage occurs uh, because of the wind, uh, the pollen grains can be easily reached out uh, in uh, the appropriate amount. Next, stigma is large and feathery. This is just to catch the wind carried pollen grains. Some examples are wheat, maize, palm and grasses. Now, come to the differences between wind pollinated and insect pollinated flowers or plants. So, wind pollinated plants, they are generally small. Insect pollinated plants are either large or grouped to form large clusters. Wind pollinated plants are usually inconspicuous. Inconspicuous means generally the thing uh, on which we uh, don't pay much attention. This is due to their dull colors. So, insect pollinated plants are bright in color. Uh, so, uh, they are bright in color in uh, reference to some of the parts like corolla, calyx or bracts to attract insects. Wind pollinated plants or flowers are odorless. They don't have any smell or fragrance. They are devoid of nectar also. So, nectaries are absent. So, the main source of food is absent in wind pollinated plants. So, insects generally uh, don't want to uh, come on uh, such plants or flowers. Insect pollinated plants or flowers, they are strongly ordered and usually possess nectar or edible pollen. So, pollen grains are edible in case of such plants or flowers. Wind pollinated plants, the pollens are produced in large numbers because there are much chances of wastage because of wind. Insect pollinated plants uh, produce fewer number of pollen grains. Good examples of wind pollinated plants are Urtica, Maize, Parthenium. Insect pollinated plants are Rose, Snapdragon, Calotropis. Now come to the pollination by water. So uh, it occurs in all the aquatic plants, those plants which are present in the water or which grow in the water. So uh, the water currents bring pollen grains from anthers of a male flower to the stigma of the female flower. So examples are Hydrilla and Velisneria. In this picture, this is uh, an image shows um, a plant, Velisneria. This is an aquatic plant uh, and in this plant, pollination is being carried out with the help of water. So this is the male plant, this is the female plant the male uh, Velisneria plant releases stamen or pollen grains at the time of maturity and those pollen grains remain floating uh, on uh, the surface of water or water currents and when they uh, attain maturity, they approach female plant. So, uh, here is the flower of the female plant body. The, uh, the pollen grain uh, approaches the pollen grains approach uh, the stigma of uh, this female plant body and uh, rest the process of pollination occurs. Next is fertilization. Fertilization is a fusion of male and female gametes. So basically the gametes are the sex cells which uh, take part in reproduction and sex cells in case of male are pollen grains and in case of females the sex cells include this is the ovary ovary which releases ovules so fertilization occurs after seed formation or seed set next there are uh, some events involved in fertilization to take place number one pollen tube germination number two pollen tube enters the ovule that is in the female gametophyte. Number three, fusion of male and female gametes. So, um, let's have a look uh, at uh, number one, uh, number one point, pollen tube germination. So, pollen tube carries two male gametes and uh, if you could see this is uh, the pollen. Uh, so, pollen grains land on the stigma part of the female plant body and if it is found that uh, the compatibility exists, and uh, it is of same species, then pollen tube starts uh, germinating inside this 
stock like structure or this flask shaped structure which is style so pollen tube grows inside this structure it grows downward and uh, later it reaches to the female gametophyte that is uh, the um, ovule and inside the ovule egg or female gamete is located next fusion of male and female gametes so these two male gametes fuse with the female gametophyte and this is how the process of fertilization occurs next once the fertilization occurs now after fertilization there are uh, many changes which occur in a plant body so uh, there is uh, the fate of a flower after fertilization that what happens after fertilization or what are the changes which occur before and after let's see so flower loses its bright color after fertilization next sepals petals and stamens they all fall off or shed off next ovary increases in size and becomes fruit ovary wall becomes the fruit wall inside the ovary the ovules develop into the seeds next come to the types of fruits so fruits are generally of two types dry and fleshy dry fruits please don't get confused uh, with those dry fruits like almonds or cashews or peanuts no these dry fruits are different dry fruits are those fruits in which the fruit wall is thin and dry the examples of such fruits are pea cotton lady finger maize sunflower and bean next another type is fleshy fruits so fleshy fruits are those fruits in which the wall is thick and fleshy the fruit wall is thick and fleshy good examples are mango tomato brinjal orange coconut plum yes we can see in uh, these examples that fruit wall in uh, mango tomato brinjal orange coconut plum uh, that is thick and they are fleshy too next come to the parts of a fruit so there are uh, different parts of a fruit for example if we take an example of mango the pericarp or the fruit wall that is divided into three sub layers or three sub parts epicarp mesocarp and endocarp here epi means upper endo means inner and meso means middle so epicar forms the outer skin and since it is present on the outer side so it is protective in nature mesocarp is present in the middle side or mid part of uh, uh, the seed so it is fleshy and edible next is endocarp endocarp is stony and very hard wall next part is seed seed is divided into embryo endosperm and seed coat embryo uh, later forms the baby plant endosperm contains the reserved food for uh, the developing embryo next seed coat seed coat is divided into testa and integument so there are two types of seed coats now come to the functions of a fruit number 1 protection it protects the seed from animals and any other unfavorable climatic conditions number 2 it helps in seed dispersal number 3 it is a storehouse of food material number 1 it protects the seeds from animals and any type of unfavorable climatic conditions and any type of unfavorable climatic conditions include harsh temperature harsh ph okay or any of uh, the adverse soil conditions number 2 it helps in dispersal of seeds to distant places from one place to another it is a storehouse of the food material food material could be in the form of any of the food components like vitamins minerals any of the food components next the seed so basically after fertilization once the fertilization happened 
the ovules are converted into the seeds it is written here after fertilization not before that so a seed consists of embryo one or two cotyledons cotyledons could be one or two depending on the type of species an embryo is represented by plumule and radical these are the two parts in an embryo so plumule is the part of embryo from where the leaf or the shoot system arises and radical is the part from where the root system arises or the roots arise next there is a seed coat if you could see in this seed seed coat is present seed coat provides protection to the seed and uh, along with the seed coat in a seed plumule and radical are present that we have already discussed plumule is a part from where the shoot system arises radical is a part from where the root system arises and these are the two cotyledons present in this seed now on germination this we have already covered that plumule uh, gets converted into shoot system and radical gets converted into root system next types of seeds so based on the number of cotyledons in a seed the seeds can be divided into dicot seed and monocot seed dicot seed here dicot here cot cot means cotyledons or cotyledon and di means two in number and here mono means one or single and cot means cotyledon so dicot seeds are the type of seeds in which two cotyledons are present and in monocot seed only one or single cotyledon is present so examples of dicot seeds are gram p beans and examples of monocot seeds are maize wheat and rice now come to the differences between dicot and monocot seeds number 1 dicot in dicot seed the seed coat is distinct from the fruit wall in monocot seed the seed coat is completely fused with the pericarp pericarp is the fruit wall i am writing here this is the fruit wall now number 2 there are two cotyledons in a seed yes in dicot seed we have just discussed that there are two cotyledons present in monocot seed there is a single cotyledon present in a seed number 3 and number 3 endosperm is absent in case of a dicot seed and endosperm is present in case of a monocot seed and what is this term endosperm uh, so this is a layer present in a seed this helps to nourish the developing embryo basically it helps or it feeds the developing embryo now in dicot seed there is no protective sheath for the plumule and radical but in case of a monocot seed plumule is protected by coleoptile while a radical is protected by the coleorhiza so uh, here is a trick how you can remember this so here radical from where uh, the root arises right to so rhiza root r for rhiza r for root and r for radical now come to the seed germination so seed germination is a process in which an embryo of a seed becomes active and grows into a new plant and once there is a favorable condition present once there are some favorable conditions present like a uh, good temperature ph or anything which is required to uh, germinate a seed next there are some processes involved in the process of germination those processes are number 1 so here are some steps i have written uh, for you number 
seeds uptake water so first water is consumed by the seeds and as a result uh, the water plays a very important role here so as a result the enzymes get activated in a seed number 3 or number third step the stored food is digested next seed gets swelled next the seeds get swollen up next the seed coat becomes soft and as a result once the seed coat becomes soft the radical and plumule starts growing and after uh, their germination what happens that root arises from the radical part and shoot system that is leaf stem they arise from the plumule part so uh, uh this is the diagram showing the seed germination here you can see this is the seed and the radical emerges first and grows down so this part is the radical and it grows first now it goes down and forms the roots now here plumule grows out outside or above the ground and as a result the stem is developed stem or you can say the shoot system arises from here shoot system arises now roots are present now uh, stem is also present now first leaves arise or and they start appearing above the ground so shoot penetrates out or above the ground now there are some conditions which are necessary for germination number 1 water water is required for swelling and bursting up the seed water also activates many enzymes present inside the seed number 2 next to dissolve the stored food to feed the embryo any of the stored food material which is present inside a seed uh, get dissolved uh, with the help of water and as a result it uh, provides nourishment to the developing embryo next oxygen oxygen is required for the process of respiration next temperature temperature is also very important temperature plays a very important role here so around 25 degree celsius of temperature to 35 degree celsius of temperature is considered as the appropriate temperature for a seed to germinate now there are two types of germination number 1 epigeal germination and number 2 is hypogeal germination later we'll discuss with the help of a diagram also so first uh, let's see the examples of them so epigeal germination is shown by bean castor sunflower pap papaya cucumber and cotton hypogeal germination is shown by a maize seed gram p so there are many other examples also but uh, some of the examples which i have listed here are these next types of seed germination as i told you earlier that later we'll discuss uh, the types of germination with the help of uh, uh, a diagram so this is that so this is the case of epigeal germination which is shown by a bean seed and this is a type of hypogeal germination which is shown by a pea seed so in epigeal germination there is a basic difference between these two types of germination that is in epigeal type of germination cotyledons pushed above and become green to form the first leaves so cotyledons you if you could see the uh, so these are the cotyledons so these pushed above the ground surface right and first leaves arise there and in case of a hypogeal germination cotyledons remain below the soil below the soil if you could see this is a cotyledon and it is below the soil so uh, there are two terms which i want to discuss with you and those terms are written here those terms are epicotyle and hypocotyle so uh, epicotyle and hypocotyle these both are the types of cotyledon these both are the parts of cotyledon so epicotyle is the part of cotyledon which is 
uh, which is the uppermost part which is the upper part of a cotyledon and the lowermost part of a cotyledon is known as hypocotyle now come to the germination in a bean seed so these are the steps which i have written for you in a very simple language number 1 uptake of water yes a seed basically consumes water so uh, the water is soaked up by a seed as a result the seed coat burst now radical comes out and grows downwards why uh, it grows downwards because it needs to get converted into root system plumule elongation plumule elongation above the ground because it uh, gives rise to the shoot system leaf or stem next seed comes out next plumule forms two green leaves or the first forming leaves Na next step is stored food is used up from cotyledons for growth now cotyledons fall off because uh, the work of cotyledon is no more now next radical forms the root system and plumule forms the shoot system now come to the germination in maize seed water is absorbed by the seeds as a result the seeds get swollen up now radical comes out and forms primary root plumule comes out and form the leaves reserved food is used up for growth cotyledon remains below the ground